Frankincense was the Swiss army knife of oils. <laughs> it was ready for everything. It was something that would be useful for every occasion. We're going to start off with a, a verse from Matthew chapter 2, and it says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born the King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. Hmm, so, familiar verse, yeah? We've all heard it before. I wonder what God has in store for us today. You know one of the hardest questions I have ever been asked about Christmas? Isn't it in the Bible? Not even religious. It's, what do you want for Christmas? We've all answered that question today about what was the greatest thing we received. And I want to talk a little bit more about the gift today. As you've heard, that's our theme. And so when I think about the gift, what do you give to the one who has everything? Now, like, that's me. People ask, what do you want for Christmas? No, it's all right. I've got everything. I don't need anything. Don't you hate that sort of person? Just give me a list. <laughs> but what do you give to the one who has everything? What was the greatest gift you ever received? We saw some interesting answers today. But mine, at the risk of sounding all gushy, was my son, Aaron. Now, Megs, don't get upset with me. <laughs> You're my favorite daughter, <laughs> number one child and all. <laughs> You're a blessing. But you know what? Our son came to us in December, one year. And man, there's nothing like that at Christmas, having the gift of a new life given to you. When I think about my son Aaron, I think, you know, here is a gift that God only knows what it means to give to us. You've got to be careful what you ask for at Christmas, though, haven't you? Like, take my brother Tom. He lives in Sydney. And he used to just flippantly answer the question, what do you want for Christmas? He said, I'll be happy with a rag on a stick, you know. <laughs> Very intelligent answer. But you know what? There it was. One Christmas, he's opening the packages. And here's this one about the size of a bar fridge, you know. And a big box is all wrapped up. He thinks, wow, they've really taken me serious this year. And he starts to open it up and there's a box inside the box, all fully wrapped. And then he undoes that one, there's a box inside that box. And sure enough, he gets this beautifully lacquered frame. And inside that beautiful picture frame is a rag on a stick. <laughs> they did it. They gave him what he asked for. <laughs> Man, you've got to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> but what is it? that you really want but you never seem to get other than Australia winning the World Cup. <laughs> you know, what is it that you really want? If somebody understood who you were and what you really craved for, what would they give you? We're starting the new series called The Gift, very appropriately, and we give credit to LifeChurch.tv. They're so generous with their notes and, and helps in this series, so thank you for that. But this particular first part of the series has a subtitle, The Gift, No One Understands Me. Nobody in this room would ever feel that way. No one understands me. But you have to be honest about Christmas messages. You've probably heard them all. Is there anything new that you could hear about Christmas? Anything possibly different? Well, I've been praying about what we should expect. I would like it to be as though Jesus walked in today and you heard from him exactly the words that he needed you to hear. No pressure on me at all. But you know what? I'm just so in love with the idea that God uses us, Josephs, the humble ones, the ones that are just willing to do what he wants to do. And I pray and believe that he's going to help us in that way. We're talking about wise men today. Wise men, magi. 
I've been doing a lot of research in Women's Day and all those important, I mean, other books about what Magi were. And I found these beautiful notes and from commentary by a guy named Barnes. And he says this, the original word here is magoi from the Greek, as you know. And from the Greek magoi, we get the word magician. And in these days, magicians are kind of somewhere between illusionists and entertainers or on the dark side. But in those days, a magician, a magi, was one who was skilled in philosophy, in science, in religion. They were the scientists of their day. They were highly honoured and they could study the stars and actually read things in those stars. You go out at night time, you marvel at the stars, but wouldn't it be interesting to say, see, that one, that's new, and that means something. They were those kind of guys. And, and it says um, in Daniel chapter 2, we know about Magi because when Daniel interpreted the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, what did he do? Nebuchadnezzar said, right, from now on, you're my chief Magi. We know what they look like. They're people skilled in listening to God. And so we know what Magi are. Very educated in medicine, nature, and wealthy. Very wealthy. They're free from the domination of kings and they're not worried about what others think. They're going to tell the truth no matter what happens. And so these are the Magi that came to visit Herod. Herod was a king, a very jealous king. A king that had already made sure that his family members were put aside, that means killed, so that he could be the chief. He was a good friend of Mark Anthony, uh, the, not from the movies, but the real one. And he was placed in that position by none other than Julius Caesar and kept there by Octavius when he came along as the ruler of Palestine with all that goes with that. So here's the man, the, uh, what we call... Herod Magnus meeting the Magi. There's a play on words. You know what? He was somebody that knew his position was solid and strong. Nobody's going to take it away from him. And then the Magi comes saying, oh, we're here to see the king who was born king of Israel. And Herod's saying, oh, that's nice. <laughs> who are these guys? Get them out of here. And they searched the scriptures to find out what was said. Nativity scenes often show us the wise men. I think we might even have one. Oh, there it is. You know, this is a very popular image. Even in our Christmas lights display at home, we have three wise men. Why? Because that's what we traditionally do. There were three gifts. There must be three wise men, right? But all it says is wise men came from the east. So we don't really know. Does it matter? Not really. But isn't it interesting to me that a lot of the things we associate with Christmas, we kind of inherit, but they're not actually the truth. So wouldn't it be good if we can break down to the very bare bones of what the story is about? Now, I know there were only three wise men. They came to my house and helped put up the Christmas lights recently. Uh, Mark and Andrew and Jai, thank you very much. <laughs> they're my wise men. They've come and helped. But, you know, even online you can think about this. What are the traditions that we know about uh, Christmas that we've just accepted, but they're actually not so much the truth? We want to break through to the, the truth itself. And so we pick it up again in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 10, when he says this, When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And they entered the house the house, not the manger. They entered the house where they saw the child and his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. These guys who knew what they were looking for bowed down to the king of kings and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. We know them because they're traditional, but we don't really understand what they are much. Gold, yes, I understand gold. <laughs> you can give me that for Christmas, <laughs> no problems. But you know what? You've heard about what would have happened if there, there were three wise women instead of three wise men. 
Yeah, they would have stopped and asked for directions. And <laughs> yeah, they would have arrived on time. They would have helped deliver the baby. They would have cleaned the stable. They would have made a casserole. <laughs> They would have brought practical gifts, you know. What would be the nappies, wipes, you know, onesies, dummies? What about a nasal aspirator? That's a real thing. It's a fancy name for a snot sucker. I'm talking about real things here, but, you know, this is what women would have done. But we know it was men. And what did I bring? Well, over here. I brought the Cadbury favourites. <laughs> you can all share them later. <laughs> what would you bring to Jesus? What would he really want from you? That's a good question, isn't it? But I believe God would say none of these gifts was an accident. They were all on purpose gifts. So they weren't so silly after all. <laughs> the men that brought these gifts were thinking, what should we honour God with when we come? They each had significant meanings in God's plan and economy. So are you ready to go a little bit deeper? Yeah, yeah, a little bit deeper? Yeah, okay. Let's see if we can do it. Gold. Gold is what you bring to kings. It's a tribute to a greater power. So they brought gold to the king of kings. Myrrh. Myrrh is used with the suffering servant. The lamb was covered with this myrrh, this, this uh, essence that was around it. And frankincense, we'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Let's focus on that. Well, frankincense is kind of the essential, the essential oil gods told me about this. They said frankincense was the Swiss army knife of oils. <laughs> it was ready for everything. It was something that would be useful for every occasion. When I think about it, there's some big words I need to, to use about frankincense to describe it. It possesses antiseptic, astringent, carminative, diuretic, digestive, sedative, uterine, and vulnerable therapeutic properties. Ask the nurses and doctors around, they'll tell you what all that means. But you know what? It just means that this frankincense was useful. It was very valued. And even if I bought some today, I looked it up online, I would be spending around $1,800 for a litre of that stuff. It's worth a lot even today. That's so I didn't bring any, sorry. <laughs> well, it's a very expensive practical gift. It helped to heal and treat sicknesses and wounds. It was also a spiritual thing. It was used in the, by the priests when they would offer up a sacrifice to God they would take frankincense and mix it in with that smoke and it was kind of like the prayers of the people ascending to God in heaven. So frankincense had a lot of meaning. When they brought it, it was for a purpose to tell us something about what they knew about this holy child. The priest burned that in incense and it rose up to heaven. It symbolized the priestly nature of who Jesus is a high priest. Now, unless you're a Catholic or a Jewish person or from another religion that uses priests, you probably wouldn't relate very much to that idea. It's a bit confusing, isn't it? Why do we need a priest? The priests represent the people to God. And they represent God to the people. They're kind of like a conduit, a mediator that goes between God and per the man, you know, and men and mankind. So we need to have a priest so that we know that our prayers are going to God. And we need a priest that can say, this is what God said about it. And especially in this area we're going to talk about, in the area of God's holiness versus our sinfulness. Priests made sacrifices for the forgiveness of sin. Priests prayed prayers on behalf of the people to God so that God would respond the way he always wanted to with forgiveness for our sin. So we have this from the time of Adam and Eve, the supposing forces in the world. There's the holiness of God, the otherness, the set-apartness of God. You know, 
holiness is not the nature of God. It's actually, it's not an attribute of God. It's what describes everything else about God. If you think about God's wisdom, it's a holy wisdom. If you think about his justice, it's a holy justice. You know, we have no trouble saying, I was breaking the law, got a, a fine, I had to, to pay the fine. We understand justice, right? But when God says, I judge you, everyone says, oh, hang on a minute. Who's he to do this judging? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Who else in the whole universe has the authority and the proper place to say you're wrong? Who else can say, I'm holy, I understand those things. I know about your failings and your, your shortcomings. I know. Who else can judge like he does? But it's a holy judgment. It's not a vindictive sort of hateful thing. It's a loving judgment. So we understand sin, but sin isn't a popular concept today. If you go and talk to your friends after church today and said, oh, can I tell you about what we talked about at church today? It was about sin. They'd say, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I love to hear about sin, but not really. Because uh, people say, who are you to tell me what's right and what's wrong? If it feels good to me, I'll do it, all right? I've got an elf on a shelf. <laughs> My wish list is taken care of. Uh, you know, I've got Santa, he's checking the list, he's checking it twice. I'll be okay. <laughs> no coal for me this year. Well, God knows. He knows we need salvation. We need help. And so we, I want to make this statement. If we don't understand the holiness of God, we will always have a casual approach to sin. Let that sink in. If we don't understand the holiness of God, we'll always have a casual approach to sin, especially our sin. We'll be hard on everyone else, but we'll be casual about our own sin. Because God's holiness is separate to us, he is holy, he is perfect, and we're not. Not that nice, really nice person at work. <laughs> not me, not you. We're not the holy ones. We're the imperfect made perfect by him. And that's so important for us. He is holy and perfect and we're not. We've all sinned, says the Bible. We've all fallen short of God's glorious ideal. We've shot the arrow and it's missed the target. <laughs> and we do it consistently. I have no trouble with sin. No, no, I do it naturally. It's part of who we are because of Adam's nature in us that we would fall short each time, but God knows that there's more for us and he brings that for us. God hates sin, it hurts us and it hurts him. Holiness of God is set apart from the sinfulness of man. And so what we need is a priest. Like in the Old Testament, you know, the Old Covenant days, what did they do? Well, one particular time of the year, they had Yom Kippur, which is a Jewish festival, to remember the sins of the people presented to God. There was a tabernacle and then it became a temple where inside the, the tabernacle you would have a big curtain. The outside was called the holy place and the inside was the holy of holies, the most holy place. Beyond that curtain, only one person could go in there and that was the high priest once a year. In fact, nobody else could go in, so they used to tie a rope on his leg. So when he went in, if he had a heart attack or anything, they could pull him out without going in to retrieve the body. It was that serious. You would not be allowed in that place unless you were drawn by lot to be that priest for the year. So you went inside there and what you brought was blood. The blood of an animal. You know, the greatest of all tributes, the goat. The goat, you've heard about the goats. Well, there was two on Yom Kippur. One was used for the sacrifice of their blood to be taken and into that Holy of Holies. And in there was this golden chest called the, the Ark of the Covenant. And on that was these cherubim, angel, statue type things. And that represented the very place where God's focus on the sin of man was dealt with. And they would take the blood of that poor innocent goat and put it on that, that uh, mercy seat, they called it. And God would say, 
For now, that will do. For now, I forgive you. Then they take the other goat. You've heard of a scapegoat. comes from the Bible. The scapegoat is the one that gets blamed, right? So you put all the sins of the people symbolically on the head of that goat and you shoo him off as far as you can away from the city or away from the camp until he disappears in the wilderness and takes those sins with him. And so isn't it crude? I mean, if you're not a understanding what God's up to, you'd say, that's cruel. What a horrible thing to do for an animal. You know, if animal rights people were around in those days, <laughs> there'd be no sacrifices. <laughs> Come on. Are you serious? This is weird. It sounds weird to us. But I can remember as a young guy, my uncle used to go shooting kangaroos, and we thought, that's nothing strange. But these days, I saw a picture the other day of one of our mates with a, a deer that he'd shot. And I thought, oh, poor little deer. Things change. Our hearts change. We're in a modern world. We don't think the way that most of the world has thought for thousands of years. We're strange people, by the way. In our culture today, we don't understand what the Bible is saying because we're not fit for it. We're not conditioned to understand it. Does it mean it's wrong? No. Just means we have to work a bit harder to understand the natural meaning of the scripture. And so a poor, weak animal was taken on behalf of us. Sacrifice. It's gross. It's unfair. But it's got to happen. Because God is just, he punishes sin. That's the bottom line. You know, why did Jesus have to die? He did. He had to. I don't like the idea. Some people say, I can't believe in a God would do that to his own son. No, you don't understand how gracious God is at that moment, giving his son for your sin. You see, we need to have frankincense to remind us of the priestly nature of the sacrificial lamb of God. Don't we? We need that. So we're going deeper here. And it says here, he's not only just, but he's merciful. That's why it was called the mercy seat. There was a place for God to say, yes, I'm accepting that you've dealt with that sin, at least for now. The sacrifice satisfies God's justice and at the same time extends his mercy. It's only a temporary covering in those days. The Bible was very clear on that. This covenant in the old days was not to last forever. There was a better one coming, a new sacrifice. And here in Hebrews chapter 10, we read it. And we read in verse uh, chapter 10, verse 10, For God's will for us is to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. How often? Once for all time. Under the old covenant, the Bible says, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. Never. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin. This is the good news, and it's good for all time. Do we have an amen? (laughs) You know, this is the God we serve. The one who says, I'm going to sacrifice what means the most to me because of that sin in your life. It means something to you. It certainly means something to him. And let's deal with this thing. Let's get it done. And Jesus, the high priest, paid the price for our sin. Not a temporary covering, but a permanent removal. Oh, that's good. What is it you really want but never get for Christmas? Here it is. You want to know that you can stand and face God one day and he's not going to flinch. He's not going to say, oh, not sure. What about that thing you did last year, yesterday, this morning? (laughs) That thought you had? You ever feel ready and qualified to stand before God? (sighs) Yes, I do. Not because of me, but because the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So then he goes on in chapter 4, verse 14. So then, since we have such a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Don't waver. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. 
Ah, I just needed someone who understood me. He has faced all the same testings that we do, and yet he did not sin. You see, Jesus is not a distant saviour. He's not one feeling sorry for us. He's one that enters into our life. He's the high priest who understands and cares for us. He understands all my weaknesses and yours. He relates to our trials. He sympathizes with our pain. He understands what you're going through at this very moment. How could he? Well, think about his life. How about there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, do I really have to go on that cross? <laughs> he understands stress, you know, like he understands what you're going through. What about his family? They thought he was crazy, <laughs> making all these accusations about being the son of God. <laughs> mm-hmm, a bit crazy. <laughs> but he proved them wrong. One of his brothers, James, became a great leader in the church. But you know what? It was all about what he went through. He understood. He was conceived out of wedlock to a teenage mum. He grew up in a small town where he's known as that me child, you know. Uh, we had a, a principal in Bible college. He wouldn't say the word that starts with B, so he'd say bastard. You know, it's much more polite. That bastard boy. And so he lived in poverty. He was criticised, ridiculed and bullied. He was tempted over and over again at his weakest points. At his weakest point, the devil came to him. He knows what we go through. He had a close friend who died. He grieved for the loss of family members. He was accused of things he didn't do. Even his friends, his best friends, betrayed him. Worst of all, he felt abandoned and so deserted on the cross that he cried out to God the Father and said, Why have you forsaken me? Does Jesus understand? He does. There's not one experience we can go through, hardly at all, that we could say, you know what, he didn't know what I was going through. So what does frankincense mean for us as we wrap up today? Well, we can't say no one understands me anymore. We have a high priest, and he stands out. You may be content with a rag on a stick. <laughs> I'm not. You shouldn't be. We've got much more in our possession. And I'm not talking about prosperity doctrine. I'm talking about the all-sufficient God who's got more than enough for what you need right now. Will you trust him? Let's read this last scripture here in Hebrews 4, verse 14. It says, So, because of what we know about this high priest, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it the most. That's a good thing, isn't it? We don't have to cower before him. We don't have to approach him with King James English. <laughs> oh, thou great God who hearest all things, thou... Uh, yeah, anyway. Boldly, come boldly, with confidence, with assurance, knowing that you are loved and you are welcome to come. When my kids and my grandkids come into our house, they don't ask about going in the fridge or you know, pressing the button where all the lollies come out. <laughs> they just know they're part of the family. And that's how we come to the throne of grace. Jesus says, welcome. Hi, I knew you'd be here. Everything's ready. Just take what you need. And he's not being flippant. He's saying, I'm so glad you're part of my family. That's why I died and brought you in. We can receive his mercy. We find help when we need it most. So what we've seen today is the details of how God deals with us. In the beginning, he was the word. The word became flesh and God sent magi, wise men with gifts. And one of them was frankincense to remind us, to prophesy, to foreshadow, to symbolize Jesus, our high priest, who offers his life and helps us in times of need. So let us approach Jesus. Even make that a prayer now if you want to. Have you got a loved one who's far away from God? Jesus is the Savior. Have you got struggles with finance? Jesus 
is my provider? Do you have hurts emotionally? Are you in turmoil? Jesus is my comforter. Are you struggling physically? Jesus is your healer. You got this? Are you tired and exhausted? That's only Christmas. It won't be long now. Weak? Jesus is your strength. Are you battling anxiety? Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. What gift do you bring to the one who has everything? Simple answer, yourself. I love what uh, this verse I learned as a young Christian from Romans 12. It says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what gift do you bring to the one who has everything? Yourself. That's it. Try and remember that when you're opening all those other gifts at Christmas. Oh, Jesus, here's mine. (laughs) You know, I can remember as a young person, I haven't brought my wallet with me, but I went to the front of the altar in the church. I I laid my keys for my car and my wallet on that altar, and I said, Jesus, I give it all to you. And he took me serious. (laughs) I mean, I ended up coming to the Gold Coast to minister for over 20-odd years (laughs) as a very poor preacher. But do you know what I'm saying? We always had what we needed. (laughs) Jesus, I just give you what I can myself. And finally, finally, in James chapter 4, the brother of Jesus said it this way, so give yourselves completely to God. I'm going to sing this song just now after we pray. And part of the word says, I give my whole life to honour this love. May that be your prayer today. <laughs> If you've picked up nothing else from all my gags and things, I give my whole life to honour this love. Father, we just thank you that you are all sufficient for us, that you would go to the, the trouble, the lengths that you did to redeem us as a person, to bring us back to your friendship, to your wholeness, to your family, to overlook our sin once they've been dealt with, to say, I know about them, but we're not going to dwell on that anymore. Jesus, thank you for that offering. Wise men, thank you for reminding us of the frankincense, which symbolizes that great offering for us. We receive it and offer back ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen.